Okay, so far we've seen one big example of a type of question that you're going to see in the free response portion of the AP, which is the idea that you have to be able to show that a function is continuous at some point or either on an open or closed interval. And we've done several examples of those, and the idea is to remember that for the free response question, they are very particular about what type of work that you're going to show. For the continuity question, you have to make sure that you show all three parts of the definition of continuity in order to receive the credit for that portion of a free response question. Now we're going to start getting into kind of this idea there are going to be several theorems that are what we call existence theorems. Theorems where you're going to have to show that something exists by using some calculus. And the first one that we're going to look at is here in section 2.4. It's called the Intermediate Value Theorem, which we'll call it IVT for short. Now, the Intermediate Value Theorem, the first trick here is, and this is kind of why we're building as we go, is that the Intermediate Value Theorem is a theorem that only works for continuous functions. And now you can start to see kind of where we're going to be building the, the multiple parts of a free response question. Part A might be for you to determine whether the function is continuous. Part B might be for you to prove that there is an existence of a value uh, that meets the intermediate value theorem. I'm not going to tell you to use intermediate value theorem. You'll just have to know that in the context of the question that the existence that they're asking you to prove is an intermediate value theorem. There are going to be several theorems, the mean value theorem, Rolle's theorem, etc., that are going to be coming up, and you have to make sure you kind of know the differences between them. But we're going to examine IVT today. All right, now what it basically says is that if you have a function and it is continuous on a closed interval, now this is kind of like when you go back into your science classes, this is your hypothesis. And so whenever we are going to invoke the intermediate value theorem, you're going to have to actually show that this is true to start with, or you must have shown it previously. So you're going to have to make some statement showing that the function f is continuous on the closed interval. And then what we're basically, what the theorem actually says is that, and this is almost like common sense, that if the function is continuous, then the function must take on every value between the y value at a, f of a, and the y value at b, f of b. Now, and now think about this. Now, it doesn't really matter which one's larger, f of a or f of b. Notice in this little picture that I have down here, I just made f of a smaller, f of b bigger. But it doesn't have to be that way. So at the beginning of the interval, say you're down here. This is my example. So that's my y value, f of a. At the end of the interval, I end up somewhere else, either above or below, it doesn't matter. You can even be in this same, they can be equal to each other. That doesn't matter in this case. You end up at f of b. Okay? And basically, if the function is continuous, we're saying whether this starts and goes up, starts and goes down, eventually you have to go from this y value up to the other y value over here. It doesn't matter kind of how many ups and downs you go in between. But that in order to get from here to here, with no gaps, breaks, jumps, or holes, the whole kind of definition of continuity, that it has to at some point travel through all the y values between f of a and f of b, which should be almost like common sense. Now, a more traditional way of saying this theorem is to say that if the function is continuous, just like we had before, our hypothesis, and we have some value between f of a and f of b, so we have some value k that is between f of a and f of b. Then we can say that if k happens to be in between, because we know based on this theorem that the function has to travel through all of these y values in order to get from the first to the last part of the interval there, that there has to be at least one. doesn't say that there can't be only one, could be two, could be three, could be infinite. But there must be at least one spot, and here's an example, because here's my horizontal line, y equals k, there must be at least one spot where the function has to pass through k. And there exists some x value c for which, and this, remember if you recall in your notation, is your f of c. 
and that's y equal to k. I don't know why that didn't come out when I imported this PDF. So the idea is, is that we're trying to show that there exists. This is the existence that you're trying to prove. We're trying to show that this c value exists for any k in between here and here. And that's what IVT will do for us. All right, and I think this will be a little bit more clear. Let's actually take a look at an example. But I did want to kind of talk about, just like with the continuity theorem, uh, how to prove a function is continuous. You have three parts that you always need to address in your FRQs. In order to invoke the IVT to prove existence, which is what we're actually doing here, and go ahead and add that in, to prove existence of some x value, the first thing you have to do is discuss the continuity. Okay? Maybe this is like your hypothesis. Actually, 1 and 2 are your hypotheses that come from the beginning part of the theorem. You have to discuss the continuity. Show that it's continuous on the closed interval, a to b. And then I have you saying, well, we want to calculate f of a and f of b. You have to know the y values for the beginning and end of the endpoints. And basically just say, hey, k is a number between those two. Because here's the part one of your hypothesis. Here is part two of your hypothesis. So that's number one and number two there. So we show that these two things are true. Once we know these two things are true, because this is an if-then statement, then we get the conclusion of the if-then statement. We get to actually get this part right here and say that it is true, which is that there exists some x value, which we've been calling c, in our interval, such that its y value has to be k. And then usually, depending on what problem you're doing, you should answer it in the context of the problem. All right, let's take a look at an example down here. Go to the next page. All right, so this is a very classic problem that you're going to see with this IVT. We have a function, 2x cubed minus 3, and I want to show that it has a 0 in the interval 1 to 2. Now, and this is an important point, and, I, and you'll hear me, I will harp on this all year long. On the AP exam, you must use calculus to answer the questions. You can't do things that are algebra-based or... Um, only algebra based or only graphing based or only numerically based. It has to have some component of a calculus theorem or concept that you are using to answer the question. So now I know and you know that if you wanted to, if we were in pre-calculus, and if you wanted to show that this function had a zero in this interval, well one method would be, hey, I'll just graph it and say, hey look, right there, it crosses at whatever value it happens to cross at. I could look at the table of values and examine all the points that are there in the table of values until I find one that has a y value of 0 in the interval 1 to 2. Might be a little tedious in searching out for it, but I probably could come up with it. I could also, algebraically, and this is by going back to algebra 2, I can basically plug 0 in for f of x and solve this and say, hey, it has a 0 because I can let y equal 0 and find an x. But that's not what you will be doing in the AP exam. You have to be able to use a calculus concept. So the calculus concept that you're going to use here is this IVT or intermediate value theorem. You recognize that this is IVT because we're trying to show that it has an interval. We're trying to show existence. So as soon as we see this part right here, we start looking at the existence theorems that you will know. And like I said, there's more than one. We're starting with only one right now, so it's going to be IVT. Um, once we actually add to our tool belt all the theorems that you're going to learn, you will have things like the Intermediate Value Theorem, Rolle's Theorem, Mean Value Theorem. All of those are existence theorems, and you have to choose which one applies in the situation. Okay. Now in this one, since we're doing IVT and we're practicing it, what you're going to do, now remember our steps that I had on the previous page. The first thing I want to do is I want to discuss the continuity, and then I'm going to calculate the y values for the endpoints of my interval from A to B. And then talk about that the y value that I'm interested in, that I was given, is between the endpoints, the y values of the endpoints. So looking at this question, let's see what we have here. Let's talk about continuity. Now this is an obvious one. What did we say when we were talking about continuity about a polynomial? All polynomials are continuous. You have to say it, though. You, in order to get credit, you can't just say, oh, everybody knows that. 
you have to actually say it so that they can give you credit for knowing that you had to talk about continuity. So the first part we would come in and we would say f of x is continuous. since f is polynomial. And we don't have to do anything else for this because it's one of the nice easy ones. Now, if this had been a piecewise function, you would have had to talk about, on the interval specifically, whether or not it's continuous over the whole interval, which would be whether it's continuous, it has to be continuous at the endpoints. The limit from the right of the lower endpoint has to exist. The limit from the left of the upper endpoint has to exist, and the limit has to exist for all the points in between. So you would have to actually use your definition of continuity and maybe do a little bit more work with that. This one was easy because it was a polynomial. All right. Second part. Now what we're going to do is we have to calculate the y values for our intervals. So what we have here is that the a is going to be 1 and your b is going to be 2. So I need to calculate f of 1 and f of 2. And it's really nothing more than plug and chug. You don't have to show intermediate steps and calculus. Just plug it in in your head. Figure out what it is. 1 times 2 is 2. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. f of 2. 8 times 2 is 16 minus 3 is 13. Now, is it obvious? Now, what's the y value if I say show that f of x has a 0, what does that actually mean? Let's go back to our kind of algebra 2 techniques. What is a 0 of a function? A 0 implies that the function is equal to 0. That the function has a y value of 0. In other words, we're looking at an x-intercept. Just reminding you of your terminology from Algebra 2. So there's the y value that they're giving to me. That's the k. Alright, so in this problem, k is going to be equal to 0. And I'm still in this part 2. I've calculated the y value for the left one, the y value for the right one. Is my k value, is this y value in between these two? And the answer is, obviously, clearly, f of 1 is less than, you can do less than, less than, or equal to, it doesn't really matter, 0, which is less than or equal to f of 2. Since negative 1 is less than or equal to 0, which is less than or equal to 13. Done. So that's the hypotheses of the intermediate value theorem. We have shown that both parts of the hypothesis is true. And once we have both parts of the hypothesis, then we get to go to our conclusion, which is going to be uh, the IBT part of it. Okay, so what we're going to say here, right now, because we're ready to invoke the IBT, we say by the intermediate value theorem, there exists that's the existence part. There exists an x value. You don't have to say x equal to c, although you can if you want to. There exists an x value in the interval. Oh, actually, in the interval. And in this case, our interval was 1 to 2, such that. Well, that, that right there is where I need the x equal to c such that f of x equal to c, I don't like my English there, I'm going to come back, I should have thought about this a little bit better, that's okay. By the intermediate value from then there exists an x value, comma, x equal to c, in the interval 1 to 2, such that f of c equals 0. And then I'm just going to put it in context of the problem, when you have an x value for which its y value is 0, so by definition, x equal to c is a 0 of f of x. And we're done. We have shown that the function has a 0 in the interval 1 to 2. All right. So fairly straightforward. Make sure that you have 
the two parts of the hypothesis in there, and then number three, the concluding sentence. And you do have to make sure, because they actually look for this idea that you have to say intermediate value theorem, and you have to actually write the concluding out and put it in context of the problem in order to get the full credit. All right, I'm going to leave example two for you to work on your own, and we'll discuss that in class next time, because that's very similar to what I just did. What I want to do is now let's take a look at example three. All right, now this is um, an actual FRQ, and this is from the 2007 exam. Now, we only know enough to do part A, because that's the way that the FRQ works. They have multiple parts to them, and, we, and then each part builds on the other. And so let's kind of take a look at it. Um, I'll come back to this second sentence here in just a second and talk about it because we need that information. Uh, kind of that's the bad thing about the FRQs. I want to start practicing early, but in order to start practicing early, you have to realize that you don't know enough to do everything that's on it. Now, so here was kind of the actual question that we have. Let's see if I can scroll down. They gave you a little chart. They gave you the x value. They gave you some y values for a function f. They gave you some y values for a function that they're calling f with a it's called f prime. This is going to be known as the derivative, which we'll learn in chapter three. Here's a function g and its y values, and here's a function g prime, again a derivative that we're going to learn in chapter three and its y values. They give you some information that you will need to read through in the problem. Uh, some important things that are in here is going to be this idea that they are differentiable for all real numbers. And this is something that we need in order to do this problem. I'm just going to tell you right now, we'll learn why in chapter 3, is that any function that is differentiable is continuous. Now, obviously, why am I giving you this piece of information? You're going to need this for the hypothesis of your intermediate value theorem. So I'm giving you this information right now. Now, on the, on the actual AP exam, this was not something that they told you. You had to remember this fact from chapter 3 when we get there that the fact that they gave you that this was differential meant that the function was continuous. Because if I have to address the hypothesis of the intermediate value theorem, I have to be able to know that fact. And then there's some other things in here that I'm not really kind of interested in right now for this problem. Let's take a look at the actual parts that are down there. Now notice, now you obviously are, have no idea what C and D are going to be asking, so I'm, I'm going to ignore those at the moment. But notice that right here in parts A and part B, you have two existence questions where they're asking you to show why there must be a value R or a value C such that, and they give you some conditions that are there. Both of these are going to be existence theorems. Now, B, we don't know how to do, so we've only got one existence theorem right now. When you are doing the AP, notice that what you're going to have to do is recognize which theorem goes with which part. And let's talk about why A is an intermediate value theorem. Okay, so I'm looking specifically to show that there is a value R. And look, R is really your X in this problem. Okay, so I'm looking for a value X on an interval from 1 to 3, such that the Y value for it is negative 5. And you kind of have to recognize that this is a classic intermediate value theorem problem. They're giving me a y value, so that's going to be your k in this problem. They're giving you an interval that you're looking at, a to b. And then they're going to, and they want to know that, explain why there must be a value. This is your existence part that you're looking at. And so as soon as I see this, and I start looking around for my function, I go, okay, what do I know about the function h? Now, h is given right down here. Okay, so let's kind of come down here in our part A and kind of show you exactly what we would do. So I'll bring down my function h of x equals f of g of x minus 6. Now the first thing that we have to address is we have to address the continuity of h of x. Now this is going to be a little bit more, I can't just say, hey, h is continuous. I know f and g are continuous, which is what I gave you, because they're differentiable. So kind of here's how the write-up would start, and we'll kind of see if you can recall our continuity definition is going to help me here. This is a composition, so you might want to go back and look back at what our definition of continuity for composition is. All right, so we would say since f and g are differentiable, then f and g 
are continuous. Now you wouldn't have known to write that before I told you, but that's kind of your first step. Now I have to get from that part to showing that H is continuous. All right, now I'm going to pause, give you a moment, go back and look at what was the definition for continuity of a composition, and then we'll come back together. All right, so pulling out your continuity notes, we see that for composition, that we need to have G be continuous at X equal to C, and we need to have F continuous at X equal to G of C. So those are the two conditions that we're looking at here. So kind of coming back over here, we need to have G continuous at the values of C. Well, G is continuous everywhere, okay, because it was differential everywhere, and then it's continuous everywhere. So g of x is continuous at all x, which is the first part of our, con of our composition. Also, f is continuous at all x values equal to g of x. And again, y because it was continuous everywhere, so it doesn't really matter what y value you get out for g, it was continuous for everything. Therefore, f of g of x is continuous and h of x is continuous. Does everybody know why h of x is continuous? Because a continuous function minus a continuous function is continuous the difference of continuous functions. So that's the first step of, I'm going to kind of come in here and go, one, I have shown the continuity of h of x. Then we move on to part two here. Part two is I need to calculate my y values for the endpoints. Now remember, the interval that we're interested in is 1 to 3. So I need to calculate h of 1, and I need to calculate h of 3. Now this is where you kind of go into your using the table information. To calculate h of 1, I need to calculate f of g of 1 minus 6. The first thing we do is we look for g of 1. G of 1, here's my 1, the y value is going to be 2. Okay, so we come back down here, this would be f of 2 minus 6. Then I need the y value for x equal to 2, so I find 2, I look at f, it's 9. So we come back down here to the bottom, we have 9 minus 6, and I get 3. Okay, then we look over here for this one, now we need to do h of 3, f of g of 3, minus 6. We look for g of 3. x is 3, g is 4. Okay, so this would be f of 4 minus 6. Now I need to look up the y value for x equal to 4 on the function f. So I find 4 in the table. I look for the y value, negative 1. I have negative 1 minus 6, which is negative 7. So my two values, h of 1 and h of 3, are 3 and negative 7. Now remember, from this part, what was our k value? Negative 5. The hypothesis says the k has to be in between the two y values for the endpoints of the interval. So I come down here, is negative 5 in between 3 and negative 7? And the answer is yes. h of 3 is less than or equal to my k value, negative 5, which is less than or equal to my h of 1, since negative 7 is less than or equal to negative 5, which is less than or equal to 3. kind of like to add some English in there. All right, so that meets my two parts of the hypothesis of the IBT. So now we're ready to answer the question. So by the intermediate value theorem, there exists 
an x value, x equal to c, uh, on the interval, what was my interval was 1 to 3, 1 to 3, was it open or closed? It was open. On the interval 1 to 3, such that h of x is equal to negative 5. And then there's no context for the problem because that was what we were actually trying to prove. Uh, the only thing that I might change here is kind of pay attention. They want there to be an uh, r value instead of calling it C. So let's just come down here and just make sure we match what they said in the problem. And so instead of using C there, and I made a mistake right there, we want to make sure we match and we want to go in context and X value X equal to R. It doesn't matter what you call it. C, R, W, K. Make sure you put it in there such that H of R is equal to negative 5. Okay, so again, three parts. You have to discuss the continuity of the function, which may or may not require some work. This one had a little bit more work than the few examples we had previously. You have to calculate the y values for the endpoints and show that the k value that you had that you were given in the problem, the y value that you were given in the problem is in between those two y values. Also notice on this one, the second endpoint was actually lower than the first one. So it's kind of the idea, it's not always the first one to the second endpoint, it could go either way depending on which one is larger. And then you invoke the intermediate value theorem and making sure you pay attention to the problem and use the correct letters or any type of notation that they're using. Okay. Now we have one more example kind of to show you a word problem. Now this one is something where you kind of have to make the intermediate value theorem fit the problem. So first let's take a moment and let's kind of read through the problem. We have two ice fishermen, and they're, they're fishing in the middle of a lake. One of them is going to get up at 6 p.m. and then wander back to camp along a scenic route. It's going to take two and a half hours to get there. The second one's going to leave an hour later at 7 p.m., walk to the camp along a direct route, like to pretty much just head straight home. And he's going to take an hour to get there because he's not meandering and, you know, smelling the roses on the way. And the farthest from camp that either man is, is when they're at the lake fishing. So, they, you know, they're always kind of moving a little bit closer than that there. Even though the one guy that's meandering, he's never going to be farther away from camp than his maximum distance, which is going to be when he's at the lake fishing. And we want to show that there is a time where they are equidistant from the camp. So the first thing that you have to notice about a word problem like this is as soon as you get to this sentence right here, you know that this is an existence problem. And again, once you get, we get more t into the class, you'll have more than one option of which theorem you're going to be using here. But as soon as you see that there's an existence problem, right now, since the only one we have is intermediate value theorem, we can pretty much say this is going to be an IVT problem. All right? So we know that we have to figure out a, now this is a word problem, so we're going to have to figure out a function to look at that we can discuss its continuity, we need to figure out an interval that we're looking at, find the y values on the function for the interval, and then show that the quote-unquote k or y value that you're given in the problem is going to be in between those so that we can invoke the IVT. Now here's where the trick to this is. The first thing is to recognize that kind of what we have here, what we're trying to show is that they are equidistant from camp. Now, that's going to give you this idea of kind of leaning toward when or what our functions are going to be that we're going to define. Now, we're going to have to define, because we have two men, and they're traveling a distance, traveling toward camp over time. So kind of immediately, you want to think of the input to your function is going to be time. Okay? And because that's what you're trying to show there exists. This is going to be your x value that you're looking at. And since I'm looking at distance from camp, equidistant from camp specifically, my y value is going to be some type of a distance. And so when I first kind of start setting this up, I might initially go, well, I have two men 
and I can talk about their individual distances from camp. So I can define one function, we'll say person A, so I'm just going to call it A of T, and that is going to be the distance fisherman A is from camp. He's the farthest from camp at 6 p.m. when he starts wandering back toward it. And of course, he's the closest to camp at uh, two and a half hours later, 8.30 p.m., when his distance from camp would be zero. So you can kind of go um, A of the initial time is going to be 6 p.m. Okay. And at 6 p.m., his distance is going to be whatever the max distance is. I'll just call it max D, which is distance between camp and fishing. His distance at 8.30 p.m. when he arrives, of course, would be zero. So that, you know, kind of gives you an idea. And, you know, you're like, well, how do I input 6 p.m.? Well, you could make this as time equal to zero, and this would be time equal to 2.5. You can do anything like that, but it doesn't really matter in the problem, as long as we kind of get this idea. It also doesn't matter that I don't know this distance, because you'll see in a second that when we start calculating the endpoints of our interval, we don't necessarily need to know an actual value. We'll see kind of how this trick works. So I'm also going to define, let's call it B of T. It's going to be the distance Fisherman B is. From camp. And so same kind of idea. Like if I were to say what is A of six or sorry, I'm doing function B here, pay attention to what I'm doing. Alright, so what is B of six PM? It would be the max distance because it doesn't move anywhere. B of seven PM would still be the max distance because he hasn't gone anywhere. He's sitting there just fishing. Every value in between 6 and 7, he's going to be sitting at the fishing hole, fishing away, so he doesn't move. So he stays the same distance away. He doesn't start moving until 7 p.m., and then he moves closer and closer, and then once he gets there at 8 p.m., he arrives at the camp, so his distance from camp would be zero. But the idea here is that's each individual person's distance. When you're trying to do something where you're trying to figure out if they are equidistant, the trick to this is to realize that if they were equidistant, then their difference, if I were to take A of T minus B of T, that the difference between their distances would be what? The difference would be equal to zero. And so the idea here is I got to get one function that describes their relationship to each other. So even though I have one function describing A's distance from camp and one function describing B's distance from camp, you're kind of thinking of, well, when they're equidistant, I would know that A of T is equal to B of T for some value of T. But can't I just basically subtract B of T over and get this equal to zero? That's the, this is the trick that you're going to use anytime you're trying to prove they're at the same location or they're equidistant in a word problem like this. So what we're going to do is we're going to define, I'm going to call it D of T, to be the difference between the two distances. And I would know that they would be equidistant to each other. that they would be equidistant when d of t equals zero. And let's think about what we're trying to show. We're trying to show there exists a time, and we'll say a time, I don't know what letter do we want to use, a time c, such that D of t equals zero. And so do you now start to kind of see why this is a classic IVT problem? 
you initially would might have looked at this and said, what the heck does that have to do with the intermediate value theorem? But the idea is, is you are going to define your function that you're going to be looking at. And I knew that the function had to do something with distance from camp, from this sentence right here. And that my x value was time from over here. I knew that it was existence because I'm showing that there is a time. And so I'm trying to come up with a function to describe their distance between camp or their distance from camp. And that's how I came up with these two functions. And then I put them together, and a lot of times in these word problems, you really want to make the comparison to zero. You'll see why here in just a second, because that makes it really easy when you're doing, you have to show in the hypothesis that zero, which is the y value that you're looking at, has to fall in between the y values of your endpoint. The reason for that is going to be because if you can show that one endpoint is positive and the other endpoint has a negative y value, then you're in between. And so it's that idea of a positive-negative relationship. Now I still need an interval down here. So now I need to think about kind of what interval I want to look at. And specifically, I want to look at an interval where I can get, because this is my k value that we're looking at right here. So what I'm hoping for is I want to find an interval for which the y value of one endpoint is going to be positive and the y value of the other endpoint is going to be negative. Now I'm not going to use, like you would be initially kind of look up here and looking at your times, you would be tempted to use an interval from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., which is kind of the widest interval that we have. But you don't really want to do this, because let's think about where are they, what is D of 6 p.m.? D of 6 p.m., they're both sitting at the fishing camp. So if they're both sitting at their fishing camp, the distance between them is going to be zero, because they're at the same spot. So that would equal zero. And then we have our distance at 830. It's the same problem. They're both sitting at the camp now, so they would have a distance between each other of zero, because it would be zero minus zero. So I don't want to choose this, because I'm not getting the, I need a value for which zero is above and below the other one. It needs to be in between. So then I start looking around and I say, well, what can we do? What do we know information about? I know that at 7 p.m., this is when he started. Let's look at 7 p.m. specifically. All right? So B of 7 p.m. We know that equals the max distance. What would A of 7 p.m.? be equal to. What do we know about, he's been walking for an hour. Would we definitely know that he is closer to the camp than the max distance? I mean, he's been walking toward the camp for an hour. I don't know what the value is, but you actually don't need to know what the value is. What we need to know is that this value is smaller than, I'll even leave the equals in there, but Really, we'll assume that he has gotten closer in some fashion between. So what I know is that A at 7 p.m. is smaller than the max D. So if I were to actually try to calculate, if I wanted to calculate what D of 7 p.m. is, okay, I would take my A at 7 minus my B at 7. And I know that when I am subtracting these, think about what I just said. You have a number smaller than max D, and I subtract max D. What do we know about this number? This number is going to equal a negative. It is going to be a negative number because you have small minus large. So it's going to be less than 0. Notice that right there I got a lower bound. I'm trying to get K in between values. What I have right here is I'm building my inequality. D of 7 is less than 0. And now I need an upper bound for it. So let's think about an upper bound. Look back at some of the values that we were writing up here. I didn't want to use 830 because they're both at camp. Well, why don't we use 8 p.m., which is when Fisherman B arrives at camp. So let's think about that one. B of 8 p.m., 
is 0. A of 8 p.m. What do we know about that? Well, he's not at the camp yet. It's smaller than max D, but it's also greater than 0 because he's not at the camp yet. He's meandering around wherever he wants to meander, so he has not made it to the camp yet. So at 8 p.m., I can calculate this distance function. So D of 8 p.m. is going to equal A of 8 minus B of 8. And what do we know about this? We have a positive minus 0. So overall, this is going to be positive. I don't even really care what number it is. You don't need it in this problem. What we know is that it is greater than 0. So I've essentially just kind of coming up with my interval. Almost have, this is really part 2 of our hypothesis. I am calculating the y value for 7 p.m. And then I calculate the y value for 8 p.m. And I am showing that 0 falls in between the y value for 7 and 8. So that tells me up here that I'm going to consider the interval, when I start kind of fleshing this out now, do a little work on this one, that we're showing that there exists a time c on the interval 7 to 8. Now notice, you only had to prove that there existed some time between 6 and 8.30. But if I can show that there exists one between 7 and 8, clearly there's one between 6 and 8.30. So that's why we kind of narrow it down to one that we can use the IVP on. All right, now I'm kind of doing this a little bit out of order. This is number two kind of of our hypotheses. I really still need to kind of talk about number one. I'll squeeze it in right here. What's the first part of the hypothesis that we need to discuss? the continuity of the function. All right, well, let's think about each of these functions individually and kind of come back up here. A of t is a function where the fisherman starts at his fishing camp or fishing hole, and over time he's going to walk and head closer and closer and closer to the camp. And let's think about continuity. Are there going to be any holes or gaps or breaks in this? It's his distance as he's traveling. I mean, this isn't Star Trek. He's not going to be in one spot and then, I don't know, forget what they call it, materialize yourself from point A to point B and have a gap in between there. You add, Time is continuous. Time from 6 to 8.30 or from 7 to 8 is going to move. Time is a continuous variable. And as he walks, closer to camp. Distance as a function of time. Remember distance, um, usually how do you calculate the distance that you've traveled? Your distance is some component of your, I remember distance equals rate times time. So it's his speed times his time. His speed has to be a continuous speed because you can't, a person cannot warp speed himself from Two miles per hour to 15 miles per hour. He can't instantly go from one to the other. He's going to have to continuously go. This is one of those things where it's like common sense. Distances as a function of time are always going to be continuous functions. So clearly, you know, you know, I'm going to squeeze it in because it's not really a lot to say here. D of t is continuous. because distance is continuous over time. So we don't even have a lot of work for that one. That's more of the, this is a real life problem and we have some common sense. There are going to be no gaps, breaks, holes, or anything in that. All right, so I've got the first part of my hypothesis. Now I have the second part of my hypothesis, okay, that my zero is falling in between D of 7 and D of 8. So now I get to invoke IVT. So part 3. So by the intermediate value theorem, there exists a time, um, T equal to C, give it a name, such that 
d of t equals 0 on the interval 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Now we're not done here because now we have to put it in context of the problem. Uh, this distance between them, so since d of t equals 0 implies, what was our definition of d of t? a of t minus, uh, now I always do that when I do the problem, I always forget that I'm supposed to be doing a specific value, which is at c, so make sure you put c here and here, implies that a of c minus b of c is equal to 0, or a of c equals b of c, so fishermen a and b are equidistant from camp at time equal to c. So let's look back at our parts. You know, this one had a lot of work to it. When you have a word problem, the first thing that you have to do is you have to define your functions. Because you can't invoke IVT without having a function to look at. And I say functions because you really might have a combination because usually you have two things that you're comparing to each other. And the trick is that anytime you're doing a comparison, Usually you're trying to show they're equal or equidistant or something along those lines. So you come up with the two individual functions, set them equal to each other, and then subtract so that you can get a zero for your y value and call this the function that you're going to examine. So you determine your functions first. And you have to give some work up here, define them. Um, I probably should say the distance fisherman A is from camp at time t, because we want to make sure that we get in an input variable and an output variable. Some pre-work up here that helps you figure out what's going on. You know, take a couple of values that you definitely know from the problem and write them down. And then kind of figure out how to write it up so that it is an IVT problem. Once I have defined my distance function, and I know they're equidistant when d of t equals 0. I'm trying to show there exists a time c such that d of t equals 0. And then I have to figure out what interval I'm going to use. And again, so we went through this work down here to find the interval. And then I made sure that I have the two parts of the hypothesis, my concluding statement, and then put it back in context of the problem. All right, and so that is your introduction to the first very important existence theorem that we use in calculus called the Intermediate Value Theorem.